Welcome to Voices in Action, a new podcast about disability in Oregon. Over the course of this first season, we'll cover a variety of topics related to disability justice education, speak with leaders of local advocacy organizations, and learn from one another in the process. This week, in our pilot episode, we'll be talking about the COVID-19 vaccine. It's been over a year since Oregon first went into lockdown as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, thanks to the incredible work and dedication of scientists across the nation, we have a highly effective vaccine. Now, the issue is in convincing people to get it. Unfortunately, the pandemic is here at a time when anti-vaccine sentiments are at an all-time high, driven by ableism and alt-right conspiracy theories. One flyer from the Oregon Health Authority actually had to include a note that no, there are no trackers secretly embedded in the vaccine. Of course, if you're worried about the government tracking you, I hope you're not on social media or using an iPhone. When I refer to the ableism of the anti-vaxxer movement, I am referring to one of their original components, that vaccines cause autism. Scientifically, and per the CDC, this has proven time and time again to be false. But of course, even if it were true, the larger issue is that society views being autistic as a fate worse than death, given that remaining unvaccinated in many cases kills. If not yourself, then others, such as immunocompromised people, who rely on herd immunity to stay alive. Vaccinations and herd immunity are how we've eradicated brutal diseases such as polio and smallpox. But what does herd immunity look like for COVID-19? According to an article by the New York Times, quote, herd immunity is often described as a national target, but that is a hazy concept in a country this large. Dr. Lipsitch, an epidemiologist from Harvard, noted that disease transmission is local. If the coverage is 95% in the United States as a whole, but 70% in some small town, the virus doesn't care, he explained. It will make its way around the small town, end quote. This article includes a map of each state by county. At least 30% of those residing in southern Oregon have stated that they're unlikely to get the vaccine, and at least 25% of those in northern Oregon. Quote, Given the degree of movement among regions, a small virus wave in a region with a low vaccination level can easily spill over into an area where a majority of the population is protected, end quote. Another concern that the article notes is the growing number of variants. The more people who refuse the vaccine, the more COVID will continue to spread, allowing variants to become stronger. Quote, experts now calculate the herd immunity threshold to be at least 80%. If even more contagious variants develop, or if scientists find that immunized people can still transmit the virus, the calculation will have to be revised upward again, end quote. So what's Oregon's status amidst this? According to a new report by the OHA, as of May 4th, there have been 2,508 deaths and 187,611 cases. In regards to vaccinations, quote, Oregon has now administered a total of 1.6 million first and second doses of Pfizer, 1.3 million first and second doses of Moderna, and 98,485 single doses of Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines. As of today, 1.3 million people have completed a COVID-19 vaccine series. There are 1.8 million people who have had at least one dose, end quote. But we still have a long way to go, and many still have concerns about getting vaccinated. So I spoke with Dr. Hitzman. Well, I'm Dr. John Hitzman. I am the Umatilla County Public Health Officer, which is a part-time job for me. I actually am a full-time family physician in Pendleton Family Medicine uh, and have been. In, in fact, I've been in Pendleton now for almost 24 years. Um, and I've been the public health officer now for six and a half, going on seven. So what has your experience been like as a public health officer uh, during the pandemic? Well, prior to the pandemic, it's a pretty low-key job. You know, I just basically provide medical supervision and guidance uh, where needed. Uh, the pandemic has obviously elevated the entire public health department to front lines, um, thanks to um the pandemic itself, basically communicable diseases of all types fall under the umbrella of public health, and that includes pandemics uh, and other infectious diseases. Um, This is, uh, this has been a rather unique experience. You know, the last time we had anything to rival this was back in 1918 through 1920, when we had the Spanish influenza pandemic that uh, spread worldwide simultaneous to a world war. So speaking about the vaccine specifically, what is the most common misconception you hear? Well, I think the 
unfortunate aspect about this particular vaccine and the disease itself is is that there's a huge misconception that this is just a, a big political ping pong ball. It just keeps getting batted back and forth between the two political parties. Um, and that's that's actually not the case. Um, you know, we have had a significant number of individuals who have become ill from this uh, virus and a significant number who have also died. And, you know, there are obviously lots of positive um, reports of big, huge numbers. Whether you believe the numbers or not, it's still a very real disease and it still does cause people to die. I think I think that's probably been the most difficult part of this of this whole pandemic is is that we have uh, evolved as a society into being uh, mistrusting of everybody, mm-hmm. and so we no longer trust our scientists. We I don't know that we ever really trusted our politicians, but right. nobody seems to trust anybody anymore. Um, and as a healthcare worker, that makes it pretty difficult on me because we try to do our best to give patients and people uh, the best, most accurate information that we can possibly get our hands on. Uh, and we make our recommendations to the population based on those, on that science. So it's been kind of a frustrating challenge. I think it's, I think it's been unfortunate that we've had to politicize this. And of course, it helped or didn't help that it occurred during an election year, which elevated it that much higher on the on the political spectrum. So have you had any experience firsthand or secondhand in seeing the effects of COVID long term? I think they're kind of calling it uh, colloquially uh, COVID long haulers. Yes, um, there are some people and patients who have uh, come down with the disease and have long-term ongoing symptoms that have persisted since they actually had the active acute infection. The problem is, is that this virus arrived on our shores officially in January of 2020. And so realistically, we're only looking at about a 15 month track record with this virus. So it's difficult to say for those who are long haulers, um, how how long will they have to put up with these long hauling symptoms? There are some anecdotal reports, not yet scientifically proven, but there are many individuals who have had the disease and subsequently become vaccinated, and they've noticed that their long hauling symptoms are gradually receding after the vaccination. Um, I'd love to explain that to you scientifically, but I think it's way more complicated than and and we still we haven't got enough data yet to specifically say that the vaccine is going to reverse those long haul symptoms. But we are seeing it in some patients. And I think that's encouraging. So would you recommend then, and it sounds like you would based off of that, um, that even if people have gotten COVID, that they still get the vaccine? Yes, I do recommend that to every everybody and anybody. Okay. There are very, very, very few exceptions to getting the vaccine. Um, you know, even people with underlying medical conditions uh, are actually going to be better off with the vaccine than without. Mm-hmm. And the exceptions are those who, uh, the people who need to be most cautious are those who have a propensity towards anaphylactic reactions, uh, most common of which in our country happens to be bee, bee sting venom. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for people who have to carry around EpiPens because, you know, they're afraid of getting stung by a bee, um, they have to be observed a little longer after the vaccine. Uh, not everybody who has a bee sting reaction will have a reaction to the, to the COVID vaccine. But uh, Pfizer and Moderna were the first two on the market, both of which are double shots. And it is recommended that if you have an anaphylactic reaction to the first of the series of two, that you don't get the second vaccine. But that's about the only exception. Um, People who have underlying health conditions are fearful of going forward and getting the vaccine because of their underlying condition. But actually, um, no matter what side effects those individuals should experience, they're much less severe and much shorter lived than actually getting the disease itself. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of wearing a mask out in public. I'm tired of at work. Um, And I think that the only way we're going to get out of masks 
is for a significant number of our population to become vaccinated so that we really put this thing on the run. The most common variant that's currently circulating in the United States is also known as the UK variant. And both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are effective against it. Uh, And so is the Johnson & Johnson. We need to hurry up and get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible um, so that we can shut down that particular variant as well. So you mentioned the three different um, ones, the three different vaccines here in the U.S. I don't, I've also heard of AstraZeneca, but I don't, I think that's used in, that's not used here. I think that's used in Europe, correct? That is correct. Uh, Some European countries have put a a hold on the AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. I believe AstraZeneca has presented some of their data to the FDA and um, they're not looking as encouraging. I don't know that we're going to see um, an approval for that particular vaccine quite um, quite as soon as um, as maybe people would like. The fact of the matter is we have three very good candidates of vaccine right now that are very safe. Um, yeah, so what could you speak on the differences between the three vaccines? The, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are both two-dose vaccines, and they capitalize on a technology called messenger RNA. Um, Without going too deeply into the genetics of reproduction, messenger RNA is a molecule um, that our bodies will normally read off of our DNA to manufacture proteins and enzymes. So we are introducing this particular messenger RNA um, molecule so that our body will basically create the spike protein of the coronavirus so that our immune system and our immune cells will form a reaction against that spike protein. In the preliminary data, which was all accumulated prior to any of the variants being recognized, um, show it to be about 95% effective at doing just that. Um, The Johnson & Johnson is a little bit further down the road. It uses a more... um, time-tested technology. Uh, They take a cold virus known as an adenovirus. They deactivate it, introduce the viral DNA into it, and then inject that into people who will then form uh, antibodies against the spike protein that is triggered by this uh, this carrier. Um, This particular technology was actually used quite effectively um, by Johnson & Johnson Uh, against the Ebola virus in West Africa. And they have administered many hundreds of thousands of doses of the Ebola vaccine in West Africa. And while it was a big fear a few years ago, um, it's pretty much minimally problematic today. So, So I think that, you know, if anybody was concerned about Ebola infections coming to our shoreline, And I want to say that was probably around 2015, 16, somewhere in that ballpark. I don't remember the exact year. Um, We don't see Ebola here in the United States. There are still a few sporadic cases in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, But the vaccine has really held that in check. I think all of the vaccines, no matter which one people have access to, are all excellent candidates to help protect them from this disease. And I, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the concerns is that this is uh, different than previous vaccines because usually vaccines contain, uh, a, 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 you know, an element of the virus itself. But this is different than previous vaccines, correct? Yeah. The messenger RNA is new technology in that it, these are the first vaccines that have been introduced using the messenger RNA technology, but the technology has been under investigation for well over a decade. Mm. So it's not like it just all of a sudden appeared on the, on the scene. The uh, drug companies who manufacture vaccines have been working with the messenger RNA technology now for quite a while. It, it, it's actually lucky for us and timely that they were able to develop an effective vaccine at this time in history, when we are in the midst of a huge pandemic. Right. Um, and our science is, has helped quite a bit as well, because uh, what ends up happening is is that we are able to sequence uh, the genetic makeup of all kinds of species, including the human species. Mm-hmm. So, so because we had that technology, they were able to sequence the, the DNA 
um, and the RNA from these from the coronavirus uh, to get us what we needed um, for this spike protein uh, manufacturing. And then the uh, the Johnson and Johnson is slightly different. They use an inactivated cold virus known as an adenovirus. So you're actually not introducing the coronavirus into um, people's bodies. You're actually introducing the adenovirus, which cannot re- uh, replicate on its own. Uh, but it does allow for the transmission of the spike protein manufacture so that so that our immune systems can create a, an effective immune response against the coronavirus spike protein. And so can you still be uh, a carrier of COVID, but asymptomatic if you are vaccinated? We know that there's a small percentage of individuals who, after vaccination, can still contract the virus itself. Mm-hmm. And so it is possible that you could have an asymptomatic case, um, but at this point in time, we don't believe that you would be contagious. Your mm-hmm. immune them would mount a strong enough response against the virus that infects you that you probably won't be contagious to other individuals. Although there's constantly new data coming out and right. we're anticipating, you know, before this pandemic is over that we'll we'll have some more specific answers to questions like yours. So um, based on on your experience, uh, particularly, you know, in Pendleton uh, uh-huh. Is there certain information that you recommend we, uh, as you know, an organization, provide to consumers? You know, how can EOCell be most effective and and helpful uh, in in kind of one on one conversations with consumers? Well, first of all, I recommend the vaccine to everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my private practice, I am encouraging every single patient that I see to get the vaccine. And, you know, there are those um, who are ready to jump in and get that vaccine just as soon as it's available to them. Uh, There are those that are on the fence. They're not sure if they want to get it or not. And then there's there's a percentage of the population who is not going to get the vaccine no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. Our our current estimates for herd immunity are somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of the population are going to need to be vaccinated before we can really put this... Uh, pandemic in the in the rearview mirror, and mm. so obviously I encourage everybody to get the vaccine if possible. Um, getting back to the political nature of this, there was a statistic that I heard last week that forty nine percent of Republican males um, have not been getting the vaccine, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, the former President Trump, in fact, actually not only got vaccinated himself, but he had a news brief where he recommended that everybody get the vaccine. So I would really like to see everybody get vaccinated, uh, irrespective of your political persuasions, because this really is not just a political issue. It's a it's a public health issue. We're readily approaching 600,000 deaths that can be traced back to, uh, to this coronavirus. And... That's probably 10 times worse than the worst flu season we've had in the last decade. 60 to 80,000 is is a very, very bad flu year. Um, Because of our masking and our social distancing, we're seeing almost no flu this year, uh, which is great. Yeah. Um, But we are obviously seeing a lot of the the coronavirus. My last question is, you know, have uh, have you received the vaccine yourself? I'm, I'm assuming so, but... Yes, I have been fully vaccinated since the, I just unofficially say Valentine's Day. I got my (laughs) second vaccine on on January 28th. Um, So, and I had the Moderna vaccine. Um, The only side effects that I personally had from it was soreness at the injection site for both doses. Nothing more severe than that in my particular case. Um, And... um, so I've been essentially fully vaccinated since since the middle of February, um, and I wish everybody else would get out there when they're up, you know, when their opportunity presents itself to go ahead and get it. Um, effective next Monday, April the nineteenth, every single Oregonian is eligible to get vaccinated. So, um, and I know that we we initially in the in the vaccine rollout were having hard times here in Umatilla County getting enough doses to meet the demands. Mm. But um, our dosages have finally caught up to the demands. And so now we've got plenty of doses. And I would love everybody to just give the public health note. You can notify them. There's a phone number that you can call. 
and you can also log in on the Umatilla County Public Health website, and there's a link that will take you to making a vaccine appointment. Um, right now, we are actively going out to farms and food production places to vaccinate uh, willing employees to get the vaccine. Um, so we're trying to do our best to get as many people vaccinated as possible. But we've got more doses than, than we're currently uh, using. So I don't think there's going to be much in the way of a shortage right now. So in, in Umatilla County, then, um, can people uh, go to their uh, primary care physician to receive the vaccine? Uh, or are there kind of stations set up in, in certain certain areas of the county where people can go? Uh, the answer to that question is yes to all of the above. Okay, great. The, the primary care practices had to um, file an application with the state and then be approved by the state. Uh, my practice, Pendleton Family Medicine, is, uh, is now, at, effective today, has become a COVID vaccine provider. All of our pharmacies who have been giving vaccinations for a long time um, across the county are authorized vaccine providers. Umatilla County Public Health is um, also um, doing vaccination, you know, drive through stations, and we're going out to different employers to vaccinate. Good Shepherd Hospital on the west side of the county in Hermiston has been an excellent partner. They've got a lot of doses. Uh, and again, the demand seems to be dropping off. So if you're, if you've been wanting to get your vaccine and have been uh, frustrated by the process of trying to get uh, a slot, a time slot for that vaccine. There's plenty of vaccine available, so give us a call again. Um, we're happy to we're happy to stick a needle in your arm. <laughs> so, if people aren't uh, for you know ve- you know going back to kind of uh, you know issues around accessibility, um, if people aren't able to leave their home for whatever medical reason, um, are they able to reach out and? Uh, uh, schedule an appointment for somebody to come to them and give them the vaccine? Yes, they are. Okay, perfect. That, it's, that would be primarily through public health, yes. All right. Some of the other vaccine, vaccine providers include uh, Yellowhawk Clinic um, out on our reservation, uh, Mirasol Clinic uh, over in Hermiston, uh, Family Health Associates uh, over in Hermiston, um, the St. Anthony Clinic's, also have vaccine to provide to their patients. So um, contact your primary care provider, and if they're unable to uh, get you the vaccine, uh, certainly public health and our resources and our contacts can certainly get you lined up for a dose. Shortly after our interview, the J&J vaccine was, as an article by Yale Medicine explained, briefly polled, quote, as a response to six cases of a rare type of blood clot developing in people who'd had the shot. The cases were reported in late March and early April to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, VERS, a national early reporting warning system to detect safety problems with U.S. licensed vaccines. All six people were women aged 18 to 48 who experienced onset of symptoms between 6 to 13, a median of nine days. One woman died. There were also reports of blood clots in a seventh woman after the pause was announced and earlier in a man during clinical trials for the vaccine, end quote. However, the article continues to say that, quote, there have been no reports of blood clots from recipients of the Pfizer, BioNTech, or Moderna vaccines, both of which are mRNA vaccines and use a different method to protect against the virus. This, of course, added to the overall vaccine hesitancy, so I spoke with Dr. Menza a few weeks later. Yeah, my name is Tim Menza. Um, I'm a um... I'm the medical director of the HIV, STD, and TB section at the Oregon Health Authority. Um, And I'm also an assistant professor in infectious diseases at the Oregon Health and Sciences University. Very qualified, I would say, to talk about vaccines. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the most common misconception you've heard about the vaccine? Yeah, I think there are are a few different ones. Um, You know, one in, in, uh, that's, that's often cited is, well, will the vaccine give me COVID? Um, And, um, you know, because the vaccines are made of, or or made of instructions, right, for uh, for our bodies to to basically follow. Um, And um, it does contain this very, very small piece of part of instructions to create a protein um, that is part of the 
COVID virus, right? And that protein, it's, it's called a spike protein. It sort of sits on the surface. And that's really where, you know, it interacts with our respiratory cells and, and other parts of our body when we get infected with COVID. And so um, the vaccine and most of the vaccines are like this, have a little piece of those instructions and encapsulated in, in something. And for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, those that capsule is a bit of fat. Um, for the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's actually a code of another virus. And so basically those things help get the those instructions into our bodies. And once we read those instructions, once our cells sort of say, oh, look at this, you know, I'm going to make this, you know, make this, use this recipe to make this protein, um, that, that little bit of instructions gets, actually gets disintegrated. Um, the cell then recognizes and says, okay, we're done with you. And then it just dissolves. Um, and it really doesn't become part of us, um, doesn't change our DNA, um, doesn't um, get incorporated in any way. And then, um, and then the only thing it does is, is it creates that spike protein and it doesn't create any of the, the rest of the virus that's needed to kind of cause infection. Um, so, um, so really there's really no risk of, sorry about that, of the vaccine causing, uh, causing COVID um, as a result. And so I know that this, I think, a point of concern for a lot of people is that this is different from a lot of vaccines in that, to your point, it doesn't contain um, a part of COVID. But uh, this kind of new, I don't know what the, the correct terminology is, not formula or anything, but um, this kind of new kind of vaccine has been in development for a while now, correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's been a lot, of, there's been, you know, really decades of research behind this type of vaccine. And, you know, in, in sort of my area, um, in terms of HIV, really, HIV has sort of paved the way for understanding and creation of vaccines like this. Um, and so it is, it's in, it, 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 but, but really, it's the first time a lot of us are hearing about it, right? It's the first time, like, mRNA is in right. our, like, normal vocabulary, which is crazy, like, how the, how science is now part of our, like, everyday talk. Um, and so... It is. It is novel. It's still. It's still novel. Um, and um, but in terms of the the science behind it, it's been it's been a long time coming. And there's been a lot of work on vaccines like this. Um, you know, kind of prior to um, to COVID. And there's um, and even so, even though you know it's it's new, it's sort of new terminology for us. It's new concepts for us. Um, you know, it's been in development for quite a while. That said, yes, the time from the discovery of COVID and the um, the sequencing of the, of its um, of its genome to when we got vaccine into people was the fastest that has ever happened in the history of the world in the history of vaccines, and so um, and that's partly because of all the new technology that. Um, that folks have brought to bear in this response. Um, so yes, while while new and the, the the from sort of the discovery of COVID or the advent of the pandemic to vaccine going into people's arms is very quick. Um, there is a lot of data sort of supporting that, a lot of science kind of um, sort of providing a foundation for that for for these vaccines. Right, right. And you also mentioned that uh, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is different than Moderna and Pfizer, and I know that. Um, uh, J&J was kind of pulled briefly. I don't know if it's kind of back in use now, but can you kind of talk about um, if, you know, whether or not, like, what that was, if you know about it, like, what that issue was, um, and if it is safe moving forward? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the difference between sort of Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, and then we can launch into the J&J bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, each of them contains the, you know, instructions to make that protein, right? And really the difference is the coding or the delivery system. They call it, technical term is called a vector. Um, but that delivery system, so for Pfizer and Moderna, it's just a, like a fat globule. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so that get, that's what gets it into our cells. For J&J, &J, they actually use a different the coding of a different virus. Mm. Um, it's called an adenovirus. Adenoviruses, there's lots of them. Um, this one happens to be adenovirus 26. Um, and adenoviruses in, in general for us, like they cause cold, sometimes they cause some GI bugs. Um, they're, they're pretty common. 
Um, though um, the adenovirus 26, they try to pick one that's kind of rare in human populations. So, um, so basically what they take is that, that coating of the adenovirus 26, and then they scoop out everything in the inside, take that stuff out, and then they put in the little mRNA um, strand. So that recipe, that instructions that our bodies then use to make the spike protein of coronavirus. And so there are, um, there are thoughts as to why sometimes that might be more effective because now our bodies are like, oh, there's like this other virus there and maybe our immune systems will respond a little bit more um, robustly. Um, but, um, but so that's why, you know, people think that, you know, using coats of other viruses might be more, more effective. Um, but so then, so that's the big difference between the J&J and the Moderna and Pfizer. And for J&J, it requires only one right. shot in two shots. And so, um, and in terms of kind of overall effectiveness, um, all three are almost 100% effective in preventing severe COVID, meaning hospitalization and or death due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, so, so despite these differences, you know, the common piece is that they're all very effective. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, so let's talk about what happened with J&J. &J. So um, what they noticed is after about, 8 million doses of the J&J &J vaccine, they noticed that 15 women developed blood clots. And so, so again, so that's the 15 folks out of 8 million doses of vaccine. And so as a result, and that was as of, I believe, April 23rd was the most recent numbers there. And so as a result, um, the FDA basically said, okay, let's take a look at this. So they wanted to just sort of stop things um, and see if there was an association between the vaccine and these clots. And so they wanted to, basically they halted um, um, distribution of the vaccine or, or administration of the vaccine um, to look into the data. And at this point, they were able to sort of say that the risk of those clots um, being 15 out of eight, 8 million is actually much, much lower than the risk of clots when people have COVID. So one of the, you know, main complications of COVID, unfortunately, is blood clotting. And so, um, so the, the risk of getting COVID and getting blood clots is much, much, much higher than the risk um, of getting blood clots with the J&J &J vaccine. In addition, they also looked at, you know, and other folks have looked at this too, like what's your risk of getting blood clots if you smoke or use estrogen containing compounds. And so that risk is still much higher than the risk with the J&J &J vaccine. So after kind of crunching all those numbers and seeing that the benefit still outweighs the risk of uh, vaccination, um, they actually restarted administration um, and distribution of the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and, um, and, and ultimately it is a, it is, a, it is a safe vaccine. The one thing I might think about um, for folks, for and, and they noticed that the highest risk was in women who were 30 to 39 years of age. And so I think some messaging around that might be beneficial um, in that if, you know, women who are smokers or are taking estrogen-containing compounds um, might want to not get the J&J &J vaccine because those things elevate the risk of blood clots and so would, would then want to opt for the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so I think, I think it's important though, that people still know their, their risk. Um, and, and it may be appropriate in some cases to say, no, the J and J vaccine is probably not for me. I should get the other vaccines. Yeah. 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 And that, yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, kind of to your specific language, I don't, and this is, you know, obviously this is kind of all developing, right? Like all of this new knowledge is like in process. So you might not know the answer to this question, but um, when, when you say women, do you mean, um, is it kind of specific to cis women? Is it specific to um, people who are on estrogen, uh, like trans feminine people? Do you, do you know what that, what that level is there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the CDC reports, really, yeah, to be very specific about the language, it's people assigned female at birth gotcha. um, is it, how they are defining women. But I think that would translate to trans fem um, folks who are taking estrogen containing compounds and, and who may or may not smoke as well. Right. Um, so that's a, that, that's important messaging, um, that, you know, folks who identify as women, trans or cis, right. um, estrogen containing compounds, um, and, or who may smoke, I think would benefit from opting to take the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine instead of the J&J &J vaccine. 
So, uh, as a person with a disability, should I be concerned about getting the vaccine for any reason? Yeah. So at this point, there's uh, the vaccines are very safe mm-hmm. um, and uh, and very effective. I think that's the the, the bottom line. And in addition, um, the um, what we call like post marketing studies or the evaluations of the vaccine in the real world, um, to be honest, have been more um, reassuring and. Um, and, and the vaccine looks more and more effective the more uh, these studies are done. So, um, so I think um, overall um, the vaccine uh, is safe and very effective. The um, the second piece is that you know while there hasn't been a lot of great data, and the Kaiser Family Foundation did dig into this for a bit, as well as the American uh, Association of Health um, and Disability, um, basically looking at the risk of COVID among people with disabilities Mm -hmm. and sort of stratified out by disabilities related to vision, um, related to communication, Mm -hmm. um, related to mobility, and then also related to sort of cognition. Mm -hmm. And um, and really what things have, what, what the data does show is that folks living with disabilities may be at greater risk of acquiring COVID. And that could be for, from a whole host of reasons, but um, in some respects, it's, it's partly the um, interactions with other folks. So either if it's a congregate living facility um, or learn, long-term care uh, program, um, or just having caregivers you know, in the, in the house and around, um, needing that support, both social um, and physical, um, and cognitive and communicative, um, requires sort of the interaction with other people, and sometimes close interaction. So it's not necessarily possible to, oh, sorry, if I just, uh, not necessarily possible to um, to social distance, um, and so um, so in that respect. There, there may be higher risk of acquiring COVID among people living with disabilities. So that makes it even more um, it's sort of urgent that folks get vaccinated. Um, and, but I think folks hopefully can be reassured by the, by, by the data that, that is coming out around the safety and effectiveness. Yeah. And do you, know, do you know of any resources for people with disabilities regarding access to the vaccine? Right. And so, and, and it's and it's right because in, in a lot of cases, folks have to travel to right. a distribution site. Um, sometimes the distribution sites are like drive-through, and you know, are people driving? Right. Um, and um, you know, we when we think about um, you know, sort of the Biden administration really pushed forward that long-term care pharmacy partnership program, but that's really for folks who are in. Um, in long-term care facilities and usually folks who are older, you know, age 65. So it really doesn't, you know, um, take into account those settings where they serve non-elderly people with disabilities. Um, And, and there is um, sort of the, the strategy to expand um, access to other congregate settings. So, but that's, I, I don't think that's completely sort of sussed out and implemented at this point in time. Um, really because we need to bring most often the most effective way is kind of bringing vaccine to people rather than requiring folks to travel um, to vaccination sites where you may have to stand or, or wait or not get the appropriate communicative technology right. to participate in, um, in in getting the vaccine or getting it in a timely manner um, or in a way that's just respectful and dig- dignified. Um, and so, and I think that, that the mobility piece, the transportation piece. Um, I think one of the things we could do potentially is to, um, um, there's the, the Medicaid agencies have the non-emergency medical transport um, benefit. And so if we could, you know, potentially leverage that a bit more um, so that transportation doesn't become an issue. And maybe, maybe, maybe then sort of for those drive-through sites, someone is actually driving the person for, um, for the vaccine. So they have to worry about you know, arranging that for themselves. And so, um, so I think there's a lot of, so in terms of resources, you know, um, I've been, I've been, I've actually been sort of digging a little bit. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, Disability Rights Oregon has a, you know, sort of a nice um, sort of fact sheet and also sort of saying, okay, if I can't get the vaccine or if I'm chasing, facing barriers, who do I call or who do I talk to? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I'm not sure how much um, it'd be interesting to know sort of what their response has been um, around um, accessibility and, and, and have they been hearing from folks um, and, and what sorts of things are they hearing. Um, and then the other the other options for, for most folks too are our local public health agencies because the local public health agencies can troubleshoot and arrange um, different um, um, modalities for vaccine delivery if, if necessary. And, um, and they're also a really good resource um, for other, in, in connection with other organizations in the communities that might um, be able to provide a more accessible uh, vaccination experience. Um, the, other, the other place too is that um, the, the American Association on Health and Disability has a lot of other great resources just around information too mm. um, in all sorts of different, um, um, in, in different um, communication styles right. and strategies. Um, and um, so I found that their disability resources on COVID-19 uh, were actually quite quite good. They often sort of link out to other folks and there's a, there's one that's particularly good at, at Georgia Tech um, that has all sorts of um, um, information and accessible resources and, and resources by accessibility type, so Braille resources, ASL resources, um, that um, that might be helpful in terms of getting more information out into the community. Yeah, that's all. That's really great to hear. I didn't I didn't know about a few of those. It's definitely been interesting seeing the healthcare system, which was already struggling with, you know, accessibility yeah. issues, just because that's how society is, unfortunately. So it's interesting to see how kind of the, the healthcare system is almost, um, you know, it's similar to the larger COVID pandemic, where there's kind of this surge of accessibility now via Zoom and whatnot. And it's, it's really good. But it's also, you know, you can see the system definitely challenging itself, because it's a very sudden expansion. And um, not a whole lot of, you know, general education about accessibility. If you are comfortable, could you share your experience getting the vaccine? Yeah, well, so I'm a healthcare provider. Um, so it was, um, it was unfairly easy. Um, <laughs> so I, I um, see patients living with HIV. And so um, back in uh, January, our clinic, um, the clinic that I work in, um, which is a, attached to a, a public health department, um, organized um, sort of vaccine clinics for providers. Um, and then, you know, turned around once um, the um, eligibility expanded uh, for people living with uh, chronic conditions to include people living with HIV. And then we sort of pivoted and transform those vaccine clinics for folks living with HIV so for, for, our, for, our, for our patients. Um, so I'm, my, my, my experience is probably atypical and easier than, 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 than most. Um, yeah. So based on your experience, especially as a healthcare provider, then, um, is there certain information that you recommend EOSIL provide to consumers or, you know, overall, how can organizations like EOSIL be most effective in helpful and helpful in um, kind of uh, doing this vaccine outreach? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, definitely vaccine outreach um, efforts targeted to people with disabilities could and should be part of more broader public education strategies um, to vaccine distribution. You know, again, making information available in plain language, accessible formats, um, and can, can ensure that it's useful for people with a range of disabilities. Right. And then accessible information about where and when to access the vaccine um, will be important, especially as, you know, the prioritization schemes, although Oregon, I think, is pretty set. Um, I don't think there's going to be much more evolution there yeah. um, now that basically everyone is eligible, regardless of, um, of uh, underlying health conditions or age or um, and but I think really the public outreach campaigns could do better in terms of considering how to address uh, the COVID the, the COVID vaccine um, and concerns about the COVID vaccine. Right, we 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 have a lot of talk about hesitancy um, and and for folks with disabilities, I think the healthcare discrimination discrimination that's been experienced by people with disabilities um, and, and potentially having sort of an offering sort of two way dialogue. Um, uh, to discuss the concerns, um, questions, um, and build and build and build trust, um, because historically many people with disabilities have experienced discrimination, um, you know, in sex segregated institutions, um, involuntary sterilization. So, I think there's there's a lot of reason to be like, wait a, wait one second, you know, am I really getting into this? Um, and so um, 
and they continue, you know, people with disabilities continue to experience barriers um, in, in accessible buildings. And we talked about this in terms of the vaccine access, but medical equipment, infective communication, and, you know, concerns also around like the rationing of treatment during COVID, like related to, to ventilators. And, 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 you know, so, um, um, so I think it, this calls up this, this all sort of calls up um, a lot of things for people and, and probably a lot of past trauma. And so I think recognizing that, um, having discussions and, um, and, and bringing the community into those discussions and then sort of forging ways forward um, to build, you know, to, to build renewed trust um, in, the, in the community for not only vaccination, for, but for other supports, um, um, both COVID and, not, and, and, non, and non-COVID. Yeah, and there's also uh, an element there, too, of the issue of people who have had COVID and survived it and um, now are disabled, not you know, uh, or have a chronic illness and wouldn't necessarily identify as disabled, but the, the quote-unquote COVID long haulers that's also tied to, um, it's kind of being tied to chronic fatigue syndrome and whatnot, and it's, uh, I don't know if you've, you know, uh, dealt with any cases of that, you know, in terms of your work. Yeah. And, and I think the, um, I, I've heard that disability claims have actually increased, um, since, uh, since COVID, um, partly owing to these long haul symptoms mm-hmm. that folks have in the chronic symptoms and, and now, you know, essentially disability related to having had, um, having had COVID. And so, but what's interesting, and, and I don't know if this is going to change, you know, I think that, um, the orientation of, you know, folks evaluating disability claims was also like very much in a denial, right? Like, right. how can I say no? How can I say no to this? And I think this is um, hopefully sort of um, reconfigures that orientation to like, wait a second, okay, there's all this new, um, you know, experiences of disability in, in the U.S. and, and, uh, and the, the world, to be honest, with COVID, you know, do we have to reorganize our thinking about how we do disability claims mm-hmm. um and is it actually something where it's a more affirmative um, um decision making process rather than this like just looking for any reason to, to deny and and not release benefits to folks who really need who really need them um so i because I, I think the other piece is that folks who've lived you know most of their lives with without disability um, without having had that experience now are and are now experiencing, wait, wow, this is, is not right. This should never be happening to people in general. And now having had that experience of not having a disability and now transitioning, um, you know, having all these folks, may, you know, sort of coming to the system may sort of change the way we think about um, offering people services and, um, and benefits uh, for those living with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's hopefully it will it will drive a kind of a more inclusive uh, overall community. And then also just, you know, more more accessibility, so much changing dialogue about disability that's so important and nuanced and also very messy. And so um, hopefully moving forward, we'll be able to just be overall more supportive of disability and, um, you know, accessibility as a whole. To hear from an Eastern Oregonian and disability advocate, I spoke with Jeff Williams, EOSIL's Director of Housing Services, about his experience with the vaccine. Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Williams. I um, am the Director of Housing Services for Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living. What concerns, if any, did you have about the COVID vaccine? Um, I was a little unsure of the vaccine at first, when it first came out. It was developed quite quickly, and there really wasn't a lot of studies, um, long-term studies done on it. So I was a li- little leery of, of getting it right off, off the bat when it was offered. Were there any specific misconceptions that you heard about the vaccine from others, such as friends, family? Oh, yeah. I, I heard a lot of stuff. Um, I uh, A lot of... Um, anti-government type talk from uh, individuals that I know uh, that there was chips in the, that that this was a way of the government chipping everybody to keep track of everybody. Um, It was um, going to be a mass genocide on on people, 
about living in the United States. Um, I even heard from someone that said that um, they had there was antifreeze in the, the vaccine and not to get it. So there was there was a lot of uh, misconceptions out there. I would say probably hysteria type uh, information. So how did you navigate then your concerns about uh, your more scientific based concerns about long term effects with the other uh, kind of conspiracy theories going around? I just kind of laid um, out some pros and cons. I I did my my own research online. I talked talked to a public health nurse here in Umatilla County, um, and she helped a lot of, of the misconceptions of how really the vaccine works on uh, the human body, and it, it, it put my mind at ease quite a bit to where I was willing to go ahead and and. Uh, get the vaccine. So ultimately, why did you choose to get the vaccine? Um, I'm HIV. Um, I have been HIV for 32 years. Um, I am, I use tobacco products. I do have a little bit of uh, COPD. So I figured it was better for me to get the vaccine. And a lot of the other variants entering the United States were also weighing on my mind. You know, um, I, I didn't believe that. I did believe that um, if I got, got COVID-19, I probably wouldn't survive it. What was your experience in getting the vaccine? Uh, it was, I mean, quite easy. A uh, person from the hospital here in uh, Pendleton gave me a call, said that they had uh, vaccines available, and if I wanted to to get one, I went up and um, got the vaccine and left. Which vaccine did you end up getting? The Moderna. Okay. So did you have any symptoms afterward? I had a little bit the first time. Um, I just didn't feel right. I mm-hmm. uh, just felt like I, I was very tired. Mm-hmm. felt like I was coming down with something, but... The second one hit me a little bit harder. I, I did have a, um, a 101 temperature, uh, body aches, chills, but that only lasted for a couple of days. And the third day, I felt fine. Great. So was the vaccine, so it sounds like the vaccine was easily accessible for you then. You didn't have any issues in kind of scheduling an appointment. No, I haven't had any, um, uh, I didn't have any issues scheduling uh, an appointment first or second time. Would you recommend others, um, particularly others uh, living with HIV, to get the vaccine as well? I, I would. Um, I believe it's, you know, personal choice. Um, but I, I do believe that um, it's an added protection for, for individuals living with HIV. So I, I haven't heard a lot of... Uh, Individuals with HIV passing away from COVID-19, um, but um, yeah, I would I would definitely recommend it. And have you uh, had conversations then with uh, family and friends about getting the vaccine as well? Yeah, um, I've had conversations with my partner, um, um, and uh, he's really not sure yet Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not he wants to have it, but um, I think he's leaning towards it. I just wish that um, people would do their own research on the the vaccine and not listen to, uh, uh, you know, hysteria type uh, anti-government stuff that's going around there. There's no chip in the there's no chip in the, the vaccine. The vaccine doesn't have anything that's going to, to harm you. Um, it's pretty much a flu shot, pretty much what it is for mm-hmm. COVID-19. It um, doesn't prevent you from getting it, but it, it does um, lessen the chance of you, you contracting COVID-19. Um, and so since, especially since you are uh, somebody who works, you know, day to day with, uh, 
uh, helping others reach health services, uh, health certainly ad- adjacent, um, you know, with housing and whatnot. Um, where do you recommend people look to find information about the vaccine? You can go on to um, Oregon Health Authority's website uh, to check out locations where uh, the vaccine is being given. Any public health in any county in Oregon uh, has information on where you can uh, get uh, the, the vaccine. So it, you know, it's it's pretty pretty readily available. Um, you just um, need to you know have have a computer or call the the public health in your county. But the issue of ableism still remains, sometimes in unexpected ways. I also spoke with Maria, an elderly Hispanic woman, about her experience with the vaccine. While she herself had no problems, she shared why her husband has yet to get vaccinated. Um, I am Maria Handley. What concerns, if any, did you have about the vaccine? Really none. (laughs) That's good. Uh, What misconceptions did you hear about the vaccine from others such as friends or family? Oh, that, you know, there were a lot of side effects, you know, that some people were getting really sick from it and blah, 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 you know. I thought, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, you know, but I don't know. I, I, I wasn't scared to get it. What was your experience in getting the vaccine? You know, actually and truthfully, I had absolutely no side effects. I felt nothing. I kept waiting, you know, because of, you know, hearing so many people say, oh, you know, I I slept all day, you know, some, oh, I was so, you know, all day long, you know, I, you know, had a fever, I had a headache, and, oh, I had this, I had that, I had nothing. I kept waiting for something to happen, but it never happened. <laughs> uh, so, ultimately, why did you choose to get the vaccine? Well, because I don't want to get sick. Was the vaccine easily accessible for you, or did you have issues in scheduling an appointment? No, um, I didn't have no issues uh, scheduling an appointment. No, I heard that they were giving it out down at uh, Four Rivers Cultural Center. And, uh, you know, I just called and found out what time, and I was there. That's it. <laughs> Would I you... took three others with me. Oh, that's great. So have you been convincing others to get the vaccine then, too? Yes. How has that been? I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to convince my husband, though. Really? No. And he's already eighty-seven, eighty-eight years old. He's got knee problems, and he cannot stand in line. You know, like the first, the first shot that I got, I had to stand in line probably like an hour and a half or two, mm-hmm. and he would never make it standing. You know, that long because he's got knee problems. Have you spoken to uh, anyone about possibly arranging for somebody to uh, come to your house to give the, him the vaccine? No. I think there's... I don't know who. You, I don't know who. You, do, you don't know who you would contact? No. So it sounds then like accessibility wasn't an issue for you, but it was. it, it, it is for your husband then. It is for him. And uh, then they told him, uh, they told me to tell him that... Uh, they they would go out to the car and and put him in a in a wheelchair, you know, and uh, take him in. Mm-hmm. By golly, you know, he'd be caught dead in a wheelchair where, where people would see him. Hmm. So it sounds like that's been difficult to navigate then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, he's got a doctor's appointment coming up, you know. So hopefully, you know, he can get it at the doctor's office when he goes in for his doctor's appointment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. That's really, that's really, um, important information. I think, um, especially for providers to hear that, you know, especially regarding, you know, not being able to stand in line. That's, that's a super important element here. Have you tried to uh, speak to other family members and friends about getting the vaccine as well? Oh yeah. Pretty much everybody, everybody has gotten it. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So I'm assuming then you would recommend that others get the vaccine. And, And yes. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. And nobody has gotten sick from it. You know, everybody's done good. That's good. I don't don't understand how people say, oh, this or that happened to me, you know, 
oh, you know, all day long I have such a terrible headache. Me and my family, we've had nothing, nothing. That's it great. It was good. Yeah, definitely. Good. I, I would just advise people, you know, if there's a chance that you can get it, get it. You know, I mean, if, if it's supposed to help you, you know, go for that chance. Yeah. Because if you don't go for that chance, you know, then there is no chance. Right. The disability element of the COVID-19 vaccine cannot be overstated. Whether it's the fight for structural accessibility and getting the vaccine out to everyone regardless of ability, or the larger fight against ableism, both socially and internally, we must look at the vaccine through a disability justice lens. The fact that someone would rather continue to risk COVID and therefore potentially death rather than be seen out in public using a wheelchair speaks volumes about ableism's prevalence in our society and takes the phrase rather be caught dead to a darkly literal level. Other concerns include religious beliefs. The OHA has addressed these also. Quote, the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines in the U.S. do not contain any ingredients that come from animals. There are no pig or cow products in these vaccines. They contain messenger RNA, water, salt, sugar, and lipids, fats, that are not derived from animals. These vaccines were not produced using fetal cells. No fetal cells are used to make them, which means that there are no fetal cells in the injection you receive. Viruses need living cells to grow. Researchers have developed cell lines of living cells that reproduce themselves indefinitely in the laboratory, and they are used to grow viruses. Early in the development of these COVID-19 vaccines, a fetal cell line was used to test that the active ingredient, messenger RNA, worked as intended. The tests showed that messenger RNA, when introduced into human cells, produces the viral protein that makes us develop immunity against the virus that causes COVID-19. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses a virus, adenovirus 26, that cannot reproduce itself. When this virus is introduced into human cells, they produce the same viral protein as the other vaccines, which makes us develop immunity to COVID-19. Producing this vaccine virus does require the use of a fetal cell line, specifically per C6. What is a fetal cell line? Fetal cell lines are grown in laboratories from cells originally taken from fetal tissue. They can be grown indefinitely. COVID-19 vaccine developers have used two historic fetal cell lines when testing or manufacturing vaccines. HEK293, a kidney cell line that was isolated from a fetus around 1972, and PER-C6, a retinal cell line that was isolated from a terminated fetus in 1985. Producing vaccines that rely on these cell lines do not require new abortions because the cells reproduce themselves indefinitely in the laboratory, end quote. Multiple faith organizations have given statements encouraging followers to receive the vaccine as well including the Orthodox Union, the Rabbinical Council of America, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, Reform, the National Muslim Task Force on COVID-19, the National Black Muslim COVID Coalition, the National Association of Evangelicals, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In short, and once again, per the Oregon Health Authority, the vaccine is safe, even if you have an underlying condition. Quote, The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, requires rigorous safety testing before it will approve any vaccine. Tens of thousands of people, including people in Oregon, from many backgrounds, ages, and communities of color, participated in vaccine testing. These studies were done to make sure the vaccines met safety standards and protect people of different ages, races, and ethnicities. COVID-19 vaccination is especially important for people with underlying medical conditions, such as heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and obesity. People with these conditions are more likely to get very sick from COVID-19. People with these medical conditions were also part of vaccine research. According to the FDA, the most common side effects in the COVID-19 vaccine trials included pain, redness, or swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle pain, and joint pain. These reactions mean the vaccine is working to help teach your body how to fight COVID-19 if you are exposed. For most people, these side effects will last no longer than a few days. To schedule your vaccine, go to covidvaccine.oregon.gov. All Oregonians age 16 and older are eligible to get vaccinated against COVID-19. The vaccine is free, regardless of your insurance or immigration status. If you have concerns about accessibility, you can always reach out to your family doctor or local health official by going to the Oregon Health Authority's local public health authority directory. Talk to friends and family to make sure they're getting vaccinated as well. If they have concerns, help them find the positive research out there. It is simply irresponsible not to get the vaccine. 
Over 578,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S. alone. Those who do survive it are often left with disabilities and chronic illnesses. Getting the vaccine is the best way to protect yourself and others from the COVID-19 epidemic and is a great way for you to show up for your community. Stay safe, stay informed, and keep wearing your mask. 